Hello, welcome back, young adult fiction fans from the 80s and 90s and beyond. Uh, we do it all here. Nick Sal, and you are uh, watching a dramatic reading of The Hatchet by Gary Paulson, and we're picking up at Chapter 10 to see how uh, Brian handles the fact that he now knows how to create fire. After much struggle, after much challenges, he is a maker of fire. Chapter 10. He could not at first leave the fire. It was so precious to him. So close and sweet a thing, the yellow and red flames brightening the dark interior of the shelter, the happy crackle of the dry wood as it burned, that he could not leave it. He went to the trees and brought in as many dead limbs as he could chop off and carry, and when he had a large pile of them, he sat near the fire, though it was getting into the warm middle part of the day, and he was hot, and broke them into small pieces and fed the fire. I will not let you go out, he said to himself, to the flames, not ever. And so he sat through a long part of the day, keeping the flames even, eating from his stock of raspberries, leaving to drink from the lake when he was thirsty. In the afternoon, toward the evening, with his face smoke-smeared and his skin red from the heat, he finally began to think ahead of what he needed to do. He would need a large woodpile to get through the night. It would be almost impossible to find wood in the dark, so he had to have it all in and cut and stacked before the sun went down. I love seeing him start to click and figure out his plans of attack, you know, and how just to watch Brian's sort of evolution on how he sort of tackles the day with each new accomplishment, each new thing that he gets comfortable with. Stacked before the sun went down, Brian made certain the fire was banked with new wood, then went out of the shelter and searched for a good fuel supply. Up the hill from the campsite, the same windstorm that left him a place to land the plane, had that only been three or four days ago that he landed the plane, had dropped three large white pines across each other. They were dead now, dry, and filled with weathered, dry, dead limbs, enough for many days. He chopped and broke and carried wood back to the camp, stacking the pieces under the overhang until he had what he thought to be an enormous pile. As high as his head and six feet across the base. Wow, that's a huge pile of sticks. Between trips, he added some... I mean, and again, if you're like, I created fire and I'm out here by myself, I could imagine the passion of which he would tackle. I'm never letting this thing go out. So much wood is possible, right? Uh, six feet across. Between trips, he added small pieces to the fire to keep it going. And on one of the trips to get wood, he noticed the added advantage of the fire. When he was in the shade of the trees, breaking limbs... The mosquitoes swarmed on him, as usual, but when he came to the fire, or just near the shelter where the smoke eddied and swirled, the insects were gone. Have you ever experienced that if you're around a fire? Insects don't like the smoke. It was a wonderful discovery. The mosquitoes had nearly driven him mad, and the thought of being rid of them lifted his spirits. On another trip, he looked back and saw the smoke curling up through the trees and realized, for the first time, that he now had the means to make a signal. He could carry a burning stick and build a signal and perhaps attract attention, which meant more wood, and still more wood. There did not seem to be an end to the wood he would need, and he spent all the rest of the afternoon into dusk making wood trips. At dark, he settled in again for the night, next to the fire, with the stack of short pieces ready to put on, and he ate the rest of the raspberries. During all the work of the day, his leg had loosened, but it still ached a bit. Remember, that's from the uh, porcupine attack in the middle of the night. And he rubbed it and watched the fire and thought for the first time since the crash that he might be getting a handle on things, might be starting to do something other than just sit. He was out of food, but he could look tomorrow and he could bring a signal fire and he could build a signal fire tomorrow and get more wood tomorrow. The fire cut the night coolness and settled him back into sleep, thinking of tomorrow. He slept hard and wasn't sure what awakened him, but his eyes came open and he stared into the darkness. The fire had burned down and he looked out, but he stirred with a piece of wood and found the bed of coal still glowing hot and red. With small pieces of wood and careful blowing, he soon had a blaze going again. It had been close. He had to be sure to try and sleep in short intervals so he could keep the fire going. And he tried to think of a way to regulate his sleep but it made him sleepy to think about it, and he was just going under again when he heard the sound outside. It was not unlike the sound of the porcupine 
something slithering and being dragged across the sand. But when he looked out the door opening, it was too dark to see anything. Whatever it was stopped making the sound in a few moments, and he thought he heard something sloshing into the water at the shoreline. But he had the fire now and plenty of wood, so he wasn't as worried as he had been the night before. He dozed, slept for a time, awaking again just at dawn gray light, and added wood to the still smoking fire before standing outside and stretching. Standing with his arms stretched over his head and the tight knot of hunger in his stomach, he looked towards the lake and saw the tracks. They were strange. A main center line up from the lake in the sand with claw marks to the side, leading to a small pile of sand, then going back down to the water. He walked over and squatted near them, studied them, tried to make sense of them. Whatever had made the tracks had some kind of flat, dragging bottom in the middle and was apparently pushed along along by the legs that stuck out of the side. Do you have any idea what that might be? up from the water to a small pile of sand, then back down into the water. Some animal. Some kind of water animal that came up to the sand to... to do what? Any guesses yet? To do something with the sand. To play and make a pile in the sand? He smiled. City boy, he thought. Oh, you city boy with your city ways. He had made a mirror in his mind, a mirror of himself, and saw how he must look. City boy with your city ways, sitting in the sand, trying to read the tracks and not knowing, not understanding. Why would anything wild come up from the water to play in the sand? Not that way. Animals weren't that way. They didn't waste time that way, playing. It had come up from the water for a reason, a good reason, and he must try to understand that reason. He must change to fully understand the reason himself or he would not make it. It had come up from the water for a reason, and the reason he thought, squatting, the reason had to do with the pile of sand. He brushed the top off gently with his hand, but found only damp sand. Still, there must be a reason, and he carefully kept scraping and digging until, about four inches down, he suddenly came into a small chamber in the cool damp, and there lay eggs. Many eggs. Almost perfectly round eggs the size of table tennis balls. That's ping pong. And he laughed then because he knew. It had been a turtle. He had seen a show on television about sea turtles that came up onto beaches and laid their eggs in the sand. There must be freshwater lake turtles that did the same. Maybe snapping turtles. He had heard of snapping turtles. They became fairly large, he thought, and it must have been a snapper that came up in the night when he heard the noise that had awakened him. She must have come then and laid the eggs. Food. More than eggs, more than knowledge, more than anything, this was food. His stomach tightened and rolled and made noise as he looked at the eggs, as if his stomach belonged to somebody else, or had seen the eggs with his own eyes and or had seen the eggs with its own eyes and was demanding food. The hunger, always there, had been somewhat controlled and dormant when there was nothing to eat. But with the eggs came the scream to eat. His whole body craved food with such an intensity that it quickened his breath. He reached into the nest and pulled the eggs out one at a time. There were 17 of them, each as round as a ball and white. They had leathery shells that gave instead of breaking when he squeezed them. When he had them heaped in the sand in a pyramid, he had never felt so rich somehow. He suddenly realized he didn't know how to eat them. He had a fire, but no way to cook them. No container, and he had never thought of eating a raw egg. I would be kind of hesitant, too, especially if it's like a leathery egg from a turtle I don't even know about, you know, that type of thing. Eh. He had an uncle named Carter, his father's brother, who had always put an egg in a glass of milk and drank it in the morning. Brian had watched him do it once, just once, and when the runny part of the white egg left the glass and went into his uncle's mouth and down the throat in a single gulp, Brian almost lost everything he had ever eaten. 
throwing up, basically. Still, he thought, still, as his stomach moved towards his backbone, he became less and less fussy. Some natives in the world ate grasshoppers and ants, and if they could do that, he could get a raw egg down. He picked one up and tried to break the shell and found it surprisingly tough. Finally, using the hatchet, he sharpened a stick and poked a hole in the egg. He widened the hole with his finger and looked inside. Just an egg. He widened the... It had a dark yellow yolk and not so much white as he thought there would be. Just an egg. Food. Just an egg he had to eat. Raw. He looked out across the lake and brought the egg to his mouth and closed his eyes and sucked and squeezed the egg at the same time and swallowed as fast as he could. Ugh! It had a greasy, almost oily taste, but it was still an egg. His throat tried to throw it back up. His whole body seemed to convulse with it, but his stomach took it, held it, and demanded more. The second egg was easier. And by the third, he had no trouble at all. It just slid down. He ate six of them, could have easily eaten all of them and not been full, but a part of him said to hold back, save the rest. He could not, he could not now believe the hunger. The eggs had awakened it fully, roaringly, and so it tore at him. I remember, he's had, like, what, berries? Since he got there, it's been a few days. After the sixth egg, he ripped the shell open and licked the clean, the inside clean. Then went back and ripped the other five open and licked them out as well. And wondered if he could eat the shells. Talk about hunger. There must be some food value in them. But when he tried, they were too leathery to chew and he couldn't get them down. He stood away from the eggs for a moment. Literally stood and turned away so he could not see them. That's how hungry he is. If he looked at them, he would have to eat more. He would store them in the shelter and eat only one a day. He fought the hunger down, controlled it. He would take them now and store them and save them and eat one a day. And he realized, as he thought it, that he had forgotten that they might come. The searchers. Surely they would come before he could eat all the eggs at one a day. He'd forgotten to think about them, and that wasn't good. He had to keep thinking of them, because if he forgot them and did not think of them, they might forget about him. And he had to keep hoping. He had to keep hoping. That's the end of chapter 10. Thanks for reading along with me. We'll, keep it, we'll get at least a chapter up every week until we're done. Got a couple other great books I'm reading through right now. Would love your subscription, your comments, and feedback. It, it does motivate me. Uh, I'm doing this for my kids and for the, for the young of heart uh, all around YouTube. And uh, thanks again for the support. We'll see you on the next one.